Curious about how you can achieve smooth, natural-looking, long-lasting filler results? The Juvederm Collection of Fillers has six unique gel fillers that add subtle volume and are designed for different needs in specific areas of the face, like lips, cheeks, chin, smile lines, under eyes, and jawline. Ask your licensed specialist for a full face assessment today and download the Alley app. That's A-L-L-E, the official loyalty program of Juvederm, to save on treatments and get a look that's true to you. For important safety information and to find a licensed specialist, visit Juvederm.com. That's J-U-V-E-D-E-R-M.com. Not for people with severe allergic reactions, allergies to lidocaine, or the proteins used in Juvederm. Common side effects include injection site redness, swelling, pain, tenderness, firmness, lumps, bumps, bruising, discoloration, or itching. There's a risk of unintentional injection into a blood vessel, which can cause vision abnormalities, blindness, stroke, temporary scabs, or scarring. Talk to a licensed specialist to find out if it's right for you. November is getting close, and that means that the election is right around the corner. For quality coverage of all aspects of the election and expert analysis on top stories from around the world, there's no better place than the DSR Network. Members of the DSR Network get exclusive access to members-only segments of our podcasts, an ad-free listening experience, and access to our Slack and Discord communities where you can connect with fellow members and us. For the month of September, use code SNARK for 30% off your subscription at thedsrnetwork.com slash buy. That's code SNARK at thedsrnetwork.com slash buy. Now please enjoy the show. This is the Daily Blast from the New Republic, produced and presented by the DSR Network. I'm your host, Greg Sargent. In a reference to the apparent assassination attempt against Donald Trump over the weekend, the former president unleashed a long rant on social media blaming it all on Democrats. He insisted that because of Democratic rhetoric against Trump, and Democratic legal attacks on him, the bullets are flying and it will only get worse. This is deadly serious stuff. Trump is systematically trying to recast any and all criticism of his attacks on democracy as incitement to violence, and all law enforcement activity directed at him, no matter how grounded in the rule of law, as purely partisan and therefore inherently illegitimate. And right now, he's fully backed up in this project by other Republicans. Today, we're talking about all this with Corey Brettschneider, a political science professor whose new book, The Presidents and the People, looks at how previous presidents have attacked democracy in ways similar to Trump. Welcome back, Corey. Thanks, Greg. It's a pleasure to be with you and uh, to talk with you again. Okay, it goes without saying that any and all political violence is absolutely unacceptable and has no place whatsoever in a democracy. We're grateful that Trump was unharmed. Now, in his new rant, Trump claimed the bullets are flying because Democrats have, quote, taken politics in our country to a whole new level of hatred, abuse, and distrust. I mean, it's pretty rich for him of all people to say that, but this isn't a typical eruption, Corey. He's basically trying to remove from the agenda entirely any and all discussion of his very real attacks on democracy. Can I ask, how worrisome do you find this kind of talk? I think it's extremely worrisome. Uh, the president, former president of the United States is to, trying to take the main question of this election off the table. This isn't a normal election about policy, economic differences, for instance. It's really about the future of whether we're going to have a democracy at all. And by saying that bringing this topic up is somehow itself an incitement to violence, the president is trying to remove his very real threat to democracy, his promise, for instance, to shut down the opposition with prosecutions should he win, his uh, actions on January 6th, which are the subject of, of course, the criminal indictment, And let's talk about it in the most blunt terms. January 6th wasn't just any set of uh, crimes, of riots. It was an attempted self-coup to try to really undermine, for the first time, uh, the peaceful transition of power by 
uh, remaining unlawfully uh, uh, in the position of a president. So to remove democracy from this election is uh, an absurd idea and one that really uh, itself <laughs> threatens the future of the republic. A quick word about Ryan Ruth, the alleged would-be assassin. He's been charged with gun crimes. He was armed with a semi-automatic rifle, seems to have supported Trump in 2016, but turned on him. Then he became a supporter of Tulsi Gabbard, supported a presidential ticket of Vivek Ramaswamy and Nikki Haley, but made a bunch of contributions to Democrats. Now, we don't yet know exactly what motivated this guy, but there's an absolutely concerted effort underway among Republicans to say that he was driven by Democratic claims about the threat Trump poses to democracy. As you point out, that essentially removes Trump's own grotesque misconduct, a whole suite of things from the agenda entirely, if he gets his way. Do you think this is something the voting public will buy? Uh it's all in how he frames it. Unfortunately, he's very good at lying and at spreading lies. Even if there are people out there who hear the truth that Trump is a threat to democracy and act irrationally or even violently, that still wouldn't justify stopping talking about this topic because the real threat here is to hide the truth that democracy itself is very fragile. And as I argue in the book, presidential systems in particular are fragile to takeovers by uh, irrational or bad or even criminal chief executives, those are facts of political science, facts of political life that we have to attend to, and we can't ignore them no matter how irrationally some people might act if they find out this information. I want to get to that big picture stuff in a second. For now, I want to point out that this is clearly becoming a party-wide strategy, this effort to shut down debate over the central issue in this election. Let's listen to this from Congresswoman Laura Lee, Republican of Florida. And as it's directed against President Trump, it's saying that he's a threat to democracy, that he's going to destroy America. It's absolutely absurd and it is irresponsible. And Democrats and people who are speaking in these terms about President Trump need to take responsibility and really think about the consequence of using that kind of, of language. Right. Because here we are again. And so There's more like that. One Fox News contributor said that the media and the government, presumably meaning those prosecuting Trump for very serious alleged crimes, are conspiring to destroy Trump. Donald Trump Jr. called the apparent would-be assassin a Democratic donor and supporter of Kamala Harris. I think when Trump put out that rant, he was signaling to Republicans at right-wing media, run with this. What do you make of Republicans being so willing and eager to push this message on Trump's behalf? Where does that fit into the history? Look, there is a real question here of whether or not Republicans and the country is, are going to put the Constitution and democracy above party and above one person. And many people, Dick Cheney, of course, as the most recent person to say that I'm not going to choose one person over the Constitution. But there are others who are just seeing things in exactly the opposite way. They want to win at all costs. And that's the problem here. That's the idea behind the lying that you see or behind the incitement of uh, really racial violence uh, and ethnic violence. And the willingness to, to put the president first, I think, is the common theme here. Well, in your book, you trace some of the stuff back to Richard Nixon, in particular, the idea that prosecutions of a president can only be the work of the political opposition by definition and therefore are inherently illegitimate. Now, Trump was in his 20s during the Watergate scandal, and I think he was influenced by Nixon very deeply in a number of ways. Your big argument is that in retrospect, the pardoning of Nixon now looks like a real disaster. It paved the way for prosecutions of criminal presidents to be easily delegitimized as partisan and for the idea that letting them escape accountability is somehow admirable or healing to the country. Can you talk about this problem? Absolutely. Uh, Richard Nixon said famously, and it wasn't a slip, that when the president does it, it's not illegal. And what he meant by that was that the country was in a civil war. He thought that the protesters who were protesting legitimately, the Vietnam War, were engaged in a civil war against him. And that gave him the authority as commander in chief, really, to do whatever he wants, to commit crimes, to f form, which he did, an organization uh, devoted to shutting down the opposition through criminal means. At one point in discussing, we know now from the Watergate tapes, uh, a break-in at the 
uh, Brookings Institution. He says that he wants it done on, quote, a thievery basis. Now, of course, the country supposedly moved on. The pardon was supposed to say this was a one-time thing uh, and, and let's move on. That was the idea of Ford's pardon. But I think that, unfortunately, Donald Trump has taken a very different understanding of what happened. He's t- taken the understanding that really Nixon was right and maybe he didn't fight hard enough. And in fact, he would have remained in power had he not only uh, avoided criminal charges as he successfully did in resigning, but he might have even avoided impeachment had he stayed and, and, and fought the way that Trump's suggesting. And the lesson, unfortunately, that not just Trump, but that much of the country has gotten from the Nixon episode is that really presidents are different. They really can commit crimes and that when they do it and somebody tries to stop them, uh, that's somehow a attempt to shut down politics or a legitimate op- opposition. It's anything but. Yeah, I think you're getting at a real deep perversity to this, which is that virtually everything Democrats and liberals say about the Trump poses to our democracy and the system is grounded in what Trump and his advisors have threatened to do in their own words. He's threatened to prosecute enemies without cause or evidence, whereas Trump is being prosecuted with cause based on evidence. Trump has vowed mass persecution of the vermin in the opposition He's vowed to empty out the government and replace them with uh, loyalists and, and, and mindlessly loyal foot soldiers. He says that the January 6th rioters were patriots and heroes, essentially saying political violence against our country committed on his behalf is a good thing. He still refuses to say he'll accept a loss this fall. I think it would actually be dangerous for the system itself if Democrats were to get cowed into not bringing any of this stuff up. Can you talk about that that itself as a threat? Look, I think that nothing less than the future of the Constitution and the democratic understanding of a Constitution based in we the people is what's at stake here. And one of the things I argue in the book is that throughout American history, we've had episodes of authoritarian presidents try to use the Constitution to justify their own power as president at any cost. And that means including John Adams and, as we've been talking about, Richard Nixon an attempt to shut down the opposition party. Why is that? They think that the president is charged with ensuring stability and that opposition itself is not constitutional, that it's really a threat to the stability of the system. So that's not the right understanding of the Constitution, as the newspaper editors who fought back against John Adams argued. And and I think we have to inherit their legacy. There is a right to criticize a president. There is a right to to dissent. That's not just in the First Amendment's guarantee of free speech. It's in the idea of the preamble that sovereignty in the United States rests with we, the people. And if we give that up, if we stop talking about democracy, if we let Trump really win this debate by turning to moderate policy issues, uh, we really do give up, we risk giving up democracy itself and the idea that our Constitution protects our right to dissent as fundamental and that it ensures, and this is an idea that's been lost and and really threatened not just by Trump, but by the Supreme Court, that a president isn't above above the law, that if a president or a former president commits crimes, they can and should be prosecuted. That was the mistake of the Nixon era, to move away from that equally fundamental principle to a democratic constitution. Curious about how you can achieve smooth, natural-looking, long-lasting filler results? The Juvederm Collection of Fillers has six unique gel fillers that add subtle volume and are designed for different needs in specific areas of the face, like lips, cheeks, chin, smile lines, under eyes, and jawline. Ask your licensed specialist for a full face assessment today and download the Alley app. That's A-L-L-E, the official loyalty program of Juvederm, to save on treatments and get a look that's true to you. For important safety information and to find a licensed specialist, visit Juvederm.com. That's J-U-V-E-D-E-R-M.com. Not for people with severe allergic reactions, allergies to lidocaine, or the proteins used in Juvederm. Common side effects include injection site redness, swelling, pain, tenderness, firmness, lumps, bumps, bruising, discoloration, or itching. There's a risk of unintentional injection into a blood vessel, which can cause vision abnormalities, blindness, stroke, temporary scabs, or scarring. Talk to a licensed specialist to find out if it's right for you. I want to try to bear down on your big argument here. It's basically that we go through these cycles in American history where a large block of Americans becomes convinced or is demagogued into believing that any and all applications of the rules and the law to them and their leaders are inherently suspect and corrupt. 
and yet we do get through these cycles. How does that work, and what lessons can we take from the past? The traditional story is that when a president threatens democracy or threatens the rule of law or commits an abuse of power, that we have the checks that we learned about in middle school. We have the Supreme Court is supposed to intervene and stop such a president, or the Congress, specifically through impeachment, as many of the framers thought, is supposed to come in and stop a high crime and misdemeanor and abuse of power. But what we've seen during the Trump presidency, and I argue throughout American history, is that those traditional checks really don't work. And Patrick Henry, actually at the founding, the revolutionary hero, opposed ratification of the Constitution because he said, if a, the, the presidency in particular assumes a good person in office, what if a bad person or a criminal pers- president takes office? That person will see they have no checks on them and they might collapse the system. So what stopped it from happening if it's not the traditional checks? It's really we the people. It's heroes who have stood up and said, look, democracy really is under threat. Um, And this authoritarian president has to be defeated in an election. So in 1800, the newspaper editors who were themselves the victims of Adams, who were prosecuted for criticizing him, stood up and said, this election is a referendum on democracy. We have to elect Jefferson in an effort to bring back the right to dissent. So when Jefferson says in the first inaugural, we're all Federalists, we're all Republicans, he's really affirming the idea of a democratic constitution when he pardons those editors and refuses to bring back the Sedition Act. The problem with Nixon is we really didn't fully have that moment yet. We didn't say a president is not above the law. We didn't demand the prosecution of a former president who was breaking the law in a flagrant way. I tell the story of the grand jurors who tried. They had a straw poll, unanimous poll, to indict Nixon while in office, and they were convinced to put it off. But the pardon stopped their efforts. And so we didn't learn, for instance, about the plan to break into the safe at the Brookings Institution. We didn't learn about the uh, planned attack on Daniel Ellsberg, which he told me about in an interview shortly before he died on the Capitol steps. And we didn't learn that really Nixon was leading a vast criminal conspiracy to shut down the opposition. And because of that, we've paved the way to the immunity decision and to the idea that we should move on and not call presidents on their criminal acts. That's what Trump is trying to get us to do right now, and that's what you and I are refusing to do. And the only way to save democracy, I think, is not through the traditional checks. It's through citizens rising up and reclaiming a democratic idea of the Constitution, in particular at crucial moments like this during elections when democracy itself is at stake. You know, there's a direct parallel to Trump, another one I think here, which is that we may not learn the full range of crimes that Donald Trump committed with his insurrection attempt. Uh, You know, now that we're seeing the trial put off until after the election, it's very plausible that voters will not be given the amount of knowledge that Jack Smith has of all the inner workings of the conspiracy to overthrow the election. Uh, isn't there a parallel there? I mean, we're, we're really, and, and by the way, if Trump wins, he then uh, will order the prosecution of him to stop. And at the end of the day, what you'd have is that we would not know exactly what was done by Donald Trump and his co-conspirators to essentially try to destroy U.S. democracy. It's a direct parallel, no? Absolutely. The problem with the pardon is that it really buried all these crimes that I'm talking about. That's not something that you learn about in grade school, the attempted break in the safe of the Brookings Institution or the attempt to incapacitate, as Daniel Ellsberg put it and talking to me on the Capitol steps. Uh, we, we don't learn the true extent of Nixon's crimes. We learn instead that it was a brief period of a threat to democracy that was fixed by a pardon. And so being transparent about what happened And really labeling Nixon what he was, which was both a criminal, but also a threat to democracy, that would have been so essential for the nation to see. We would have been more prepared for the Trump threat as it started to emerge when he came down that escalator. The other parallel is to Adams, because he's saying if he gets away with it, if he isn't held to the account, Trump, of the rule of law, he really will shut down the opposition. And American democracy is fragile enough that that basically happened during the Adams presidency, we recovered from it. But had we not, we might have had a very different future. And we could have a very different future if Donald Trump wins this election, because I believe what he says, he will try to shut down the opposition by criminalizing dissent. Just to to sort of expand on that a little bit, one of the most bizarre things about the new effort to take democracy off the agenda entirely 
is that simultaneously, Donald Trump is campaigning, I think, to an unprecedented degree on threats of explicit authoritarian violence as his platform. He's literally across the board essentially saying, if you vote for me, you will get an authoritarian presidency. And now he wants that removed from the agenda. It's it's the, the, the level of absurdity is almost impossible to get your head around. That's right. And, you know, it, it fits with his general strategy of authoritarianism, which is that he'll say anything in order to win. He doesn't care about the truth. That's, of course, the other victim here. Uh, and he'll simultaneously make threats that call for an account of the rule of law or, or incite crimes, as he did during January 6th, and organize an attempted self-coup. And then when you try to call him on it, he says that somehow this is out of bounds. And the worst thing that the media could do or that really citizens could do is let him get away with it. We have to, at all costs, talk about the fact that this election is a referendum on whether we are going to continue to have a democracy or whether we're going to fall prey, as many other countries with presidential systems have, to uh, a president who would essentially assume dictatorial powers, as he puts it, on day one. And by the way, I think that he knows that if that's the argument, he loses. Corey Brettschneider, thanks so much for coming on with us today. What a pleasure. Folks, make sure to check out some great new content we have up at TNR.com. Michael Tomaski arguing that the media absolutely has to treat Laura Loomer as a major story in this election. And Jonathan Katz arguing that Trump's anti-Haitian hate has deep American roots. We'll see you all tomorrow. You've been listening to The Daily Blast with me, your host, Greg Sargent. The Daily Blast is a New Republic podcast and is produced by Riley Fessler and the DSR Network. 